and we reflect on how rare it is to have the opportunity to meet the Dharma and to have a precious human life, then everything we do becomes quite joyful because we feel um, very blessed with the present opportunity that we have. And we get that feeling by seeing how difficult it is to create the causes for a precious human life and how few precious human lives there are in number. And so feeling like a beggar who found a jewel, then we feel delighted and we engage in our Dharma practice with uh, really a, a lot of joy. And that changes the whole um, feeling of how we live our life as well as how we approach the Dharma in general. And so then even if we encounter things that are difficult that we don't understand, still we feel quite uh, fortunate to have the opportunity to explore the Dharma and learn these things, knowing that you know, with time, with continuous effort, then gradually the meanings will become clearer to us. So with that kind of mind, then let's focus on the bodhicitta and our aspiration for full enlightenment for the benefit of all beings. And then our wish to learn about the bodhisattva precepts so that we can follow the bodhisattva path to enlightenment. How are people doing in retreat? You plugging away? <laughs> yeah, is it okay? Because <laughs> um, uh, I know for a lot of you, you know, this may be your first long retreat and you're jumping in with both feet doing three months. You know, not a one month retreat or a two month retreat, a two week retreat to kind of warm you up. but. You know, jumping in with with um, uh, three months right away, so you're kind of going through Bodhisattva boot camp, yeah, and uh, and it can be tough sometimes, but as you continue and you learn to work with your mind and learn to work with all the different thoughts that come up and things going on with your body and this, that, and the other thing, then you actually gain quite a bit of self-confidence, uh, you know, that you can handle all these things and they're not going to derail you and, you know, and you begin to actually uh, enjoy your practice and become very good friends with Vajrasattva. Yeah. For those of you doing Vajrasattva with, you know, well, still with Vajrasattva, for those of you doing <laughs> succession guru yoga, yeah. So, uh, you know, you really develop a relationship with the Buddha the, that you're meditating on. And it brings in, you know, you think of the qualities of the Buddha, and it's just like extraordinary. It really brings a lot of joy to your mind. And, you know, and you, so you create this relationship that you can uh, come back to, that you can call on no matter what's going on in your life. Because it doesn't, uh, your relationship with the Buddha doesn't require the intermediary of some priest or something else, you know. You're, you're creating it directly and it becomes something quite, um, it becomes a real refuge in your life. Because yeah? we don't know what's going to happen in our life and what situations we're going to find ourselves in. But uh, as we, you know, do our practice and our refuge in the Three Jewels deepens, then we gain a lot of confidence that we can handle different things. And we also see the things that we can't handle, and we know we have to work harder with them. 
Yeah. Okay. So, you know, different things come. You know, sometimes your mind is peaceful and sometimes your mind sounds like a circus. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes your body's fine. Sometimes your body hurts. What else is new? Yeah. What else is new? Huh? Sometimes in retreat, these things become a very big deal. It's like, oh, my mind is so uncontrolled. Ah, retreat is making it worse. You know, no, that's not happening. It's always been like this. You just have the quiet to notice it. That's all. Your mind's not worse. Yeah. In fact, you may not realize how quiet your mind's gotten over the two months that we've been in retreat. You know, same thing with our body. Oh, this hurt, that hurts. Oh, I'm sure I'm dying. You know, I must have cancer here. I must have, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we get all worked up about it. And no, we are always having strange feelings in our body. It's usually we're busy doing other things and we don't even notice them. Yeah? It's true, isn't it? Yeah? Don't you always have strange feelings in your body? I always have strange feelings. Mm -hmm. So what? (laughs) I mean, this is what we get for having a body. Yeah, once you have a body, this is what happens. So it's, you know, it's normal. It's not a big deal. Once we have a mind that's under the control of affliction and karma, this is what happens. Yeah, so this is why we want, of course, to attain liberation. You know, we want to be free of all of this. But, uh, yeah. So you're just kind of learning something about what samsara is. Yeah, what your life experience is. And that's, it's very, very helpful. Yeah, because I suspect you will, you know, look at life a lot differently at the end of retreat than at the beginning of retreat. In terms of what's important and, you know, how, how you look at different things, how you treat different things. Yeah. So give yourself some credit. Come on, everybody, pat on the back. Come on. Danny, Terry, pat on the back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we really need to rejoice at what we're doing and rejoice at our opportunity. Okay, so last time we were um, right smack in the middle of one of the bodhisattva precepts. Yeah, we were doing, what was it, the fourth one, not answering questions. Okay, so he was saying here, um, it's important that we give clear and polite answers to questions that we are asked, unless there is a good reason for not doing so. Okay. So we have to, you know, be reasonable here. Otherwise, I mean, you could spend all day with somebody asking you one question after another question, and you never get anything done. So, you know, the the idea of this precept is is to be polite, you know, uh, and not uh, standoffish to other people. But also, we don't go to extremes and and just get stuck in situations where people are asking us one question after the other and not going anywhere. Okay, so he says, many of the secondary precepts of the bodhisattva vows are in keeping with the standards of good behavior in society. By simply complying with these in situations that we encounter every day in our lives, we will easily be able to observe a large number of the precepts and avoid misdeeds. And that's where last time we got into the big discussion about um, manners, you know, and etiquette and re- showing respect and, and those kinds of things. <clears throat> And who's, you know, and realizing that some people have never been taught that. And, you know, we ha- it's something that we have to, to learn. So the Great Way gives uh, several kinds of exceptions regarding the third and fourth misdeeds. So the one about not respecting elder- elders and not answering questions. So the first concerns the basis, i.e. the person holding the, pre- the precepts. When we are so ill that we're incapable of rising or responding correctly to questions, no misdeed is occur- occurs. Furthermore, when we're unaware of the presence of a senior or of being asked a question because we're asleep, there's no fault in not acting as we should. 
Yeah. So, you know, it, it's kind of like, you know, if you're really sick and your teacher comes to see you, you don't have to stand up and get out of bed and make three prostrations, you know? It's like, you know, you're really sick, so that, that's okay. Uh -huh. And then the second group of exceptions concerns our situation. So under the following circumstances, there's no misdeeds if we don't show respect or don't answer questions. So the first is we're receiving teachings from our spiritual master or someone else is speaking to us about the Dharma. So this situation happens. You know, you're in Dharma class, you're really listening attentively to something, you're taking notes, and the person ne over next to you reaches over and says, what page are we on? Or, I missed the third point, what is it? You know? And, and so in those situations, it's perfectly all right not to answer the question. Okay? Because you're in a Dharma teaching, and it's, it can be very distracting to the teacher for a group, of, you know, for people to start talking in the teaching. Yeah. Okay, second one where we don't have to answer is we're teaching or explaining the Dharma seriously to someone. Yeah, so you're in the middle of explaining something and someone, you know, asks you this question, asks that, and, you know, and, and d you know, t is taking you off in all sorts of directions, so you can't give the, the, the teaching as you would wish to, so in those situations you don't have to answer. And three is you, uh, we are trying to distract or console someone who's unhappy or facing problems. Okay, so someone's unhappy, you're counseling them, or somebody's grieving and you're trying to comfort them, and somebody comes in and says, uh, you know, uh, uh, when should I take out the garbage? Or um, how are you doing today? Or um, can you fix the internet? Then in those situations, you don't have to respond because you're doing something that's quite important. In any of these situations, if someone asks us a question and we don't answer, or if a senior person arrives and we do not rise, there is no fault. Okay? Yeah? So if you're giving a Dharma class or, you know, like I was telling you, the English class I was giving at Copan, or, you know, you're, you're doing something for sentient beings, and a senior comes in, you don't have to, to rise and, and show respect. Okay? Um, the third criterion uh, is purpose or necessity. So we're exempted from the obligation to answer, rise, and so on when it serves an important purpose. So it's better not to answer or rise in the following five circumstances. So first is it would upset people, uh, the people we are with, or disturb others who are listening to the Dharma, or interfere with their spiritual practice. Okay, so like I was saying, if we're in a Dharma teaching with our teacher's teacher and our teacher w w walks in, we don't stand up yeah, to, to greet our teacher because it, it disturbs the teaching, you know, that we're in. Okay, and it also embarrasses our teacher. Okay, um, and it could, you know, yeah, disturb the teacher, disturb the teaching, you know, the people who are listening and so on. Second is, um, it would provoke the hostility of a large number of people. So I didn't come up with an example of that. Can you think of a good example where asking, answering some kind of question or showing respect would provoke the hostility of a large number of people? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I would, the first thing I thought of was, <laughs> you know, like Lama Zopa, he doesn't uh, often care what people do. And I remember when he sees his teacher in an airport, like, I think he saw Kim Ji Sung Rinpoche, she wanted him in the airport, and he just did three long, long prostrations, you know, right in the airport, you know. So, um, you know, maybe something like that. Yeah, some situation like that. I'm, you know, I mean, I'm sure for Rinpoche it's fine <laughs> for doing this, and he probably, you know, got a lot of people on the Dharma path for doing it. But maybe for us it might 
upset people or, you know, something something like that. Okay, okay third uh, circumstance, it would be in, inconsiderate for another teacher. So a master is teaching and we are nearby. If someone asks us a question um, as replying would upset the teacher and disrupt his lesson, it is preferable to abstain. So that's the uh, situation I was referring to here. And it is, it's quite distracting, you know, when you're trying to, um, to, to teach, if people in the audience start talking or whispering to each other, you know, about this or that, or even passing notes, yeah, it, beca- it can become very distracting. So try, try to avoid that. Um, fourth is it would prevent other people from improving their attitude. So not rising, answering, and so on may help lessen someone else's pride, for example, or help a person to progress in another way. Yeah, so, um, you know, <laughs> I remember Geshe Tech Chok did that with me. Um, <laughs> because I was, uh, in the classes, I, uh, I was kind of sitting right in front. And I always had so many questions, answering yeah, this and this and this. And sometimes he would just ignore me, you know. <laughs> and one time I came up to his room afterwards, and he looked at me. And he said, "You think you think I'm being mean? Ha ha ha!" When that wasn't the situation, you know. But he he had a purpose for doing that. So, and then uh, five is it would be contrary to monastic rules or to social codes. So this applies to many secondary precepts. In uh, our dealings with ordained people or with monasteries in general, we must adjust our behavior to take into consideration their precepts and respect the rules and regulations of each religious community, regardless of whether we have the monastic precepts or not. Okay. So that also is an important thing. When we go to a monastery, then we behave in accordance with how people at a monastery behave. And if, uh, even if we as monastics go to another monastery and they keep the precepts in a little bit different way than we do, we do as they do. You know, unless they kind of say, you know, oh, it doesn't matter. I know you're unfamiliar with this. It doesn't matter. Okay, but otherwise we we do as they're doing in in that monastery. Also, as long as it's not you know contrary to to our precepts, you know. I'm thinking like if we went to a Zen monastery where they may not have all the same precepts as we do, we would act according to how they do, but we wouldn't do anything that would you know endanger our own precepts. Okay, and also. Mm, Lay people have to realize when they go to a monastery that, you know, it's appropriate to act in accordance with how people act at a monastery. Yeah. And so, you know, behavior at a monastery is different than behavior at a Dharma center or at a retreat center. You know, a monastery is a celibate community. So maybe at a, you know, a retreat center or a or a Dharma center, you can flirt a little bit, you know, nobody minds. But at a monastery, it's it's really inappropriate. You know, this is a, a a celibate community, and so that kind of behavior shouldn't be done here. You know, sometimes people, uh, lay people, you know, who don't know a lot about monastic life can get very upset. Or sometimes even if they do know about it, they can get very upset about how things are done at monasteries. I remember when I lived in Seattle, Somebody had gone to visit a Bayagiri in California, and they're very strict about not eating in the evening. And that person came back, and they were so upset, and they were saying, you know, because they, they were in the health profession, they were saying, it's so bad for your health, and, you know, they need to eat at night, and, and why are they doing this? And they were so upset with this, you know. But you need to know when you go into a monastery that, you know, people are there for a particular purpose. And if you don't want to live, have, if you don't want to have the experience of living in a monastic community for as long as you're there, then it's better to go where you do want to have the experience of, of living. Yeah. I recently heard that um, uh, somebody told me that 
that somebody told them that uh, we have a puritanical view about sex at Shravasti Abbey. So I'm not quite sure what that means, a puritanical view of sex at Shravasti Abbey. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I'm not quite sure what it meant. It was meant as a derogatory thing. You know, puritanical view is meant as derogatory. I'm not quite sure what the you know, what, what that meant. If, you know, if the fact that we're celibate means that we have a puritanical view, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what that means. Yeah? Well, you know, it just comes up downstairs, it does something in the room, and I'm remembering um, this couple coming for just a short time, mm-hmm. a day, and um, they were standing at the door at, of the office, and kind of, he was going to go with someone to eat something, and she was going to go with someone else, and they kissed each other. <laughs> Yeah. It's often the case that people don't know. So I'm going to tell your story. So you're saying that a while back a couple came and they were new to Buddhism and they were only staying here for a day. So they were standing at the office door and he was going one way and she was going the other way. And they just kind of kissed and then uh, went their own ways. And you were standing there going, oh, what do I do? <laughs> you know, because they, they didn't think about the environment they were in, or they didn't know how, you know, kind of what's appropriate at monasteries. So, yeah, this happens. This happens. I think when they're here just a a day or something, maybe, yeah, not say anything, but... Yeah. Right. Right. But also, you know, we, uh, we ask people to wear modest clothing when, when they're here and not wear tight things and very low cut things and so on. And a few times we've had to ask people to cover themselves more and give them some clothing to do so because they just, it's on the website, but maybe they didn't read it or, or whatever. So, yeah. Uh huh. Another another good example, you know, that in a monastery you don't walk around eating, and you don't eat standing up or walk by the kitchen and stick your a spoon in, and you know. And so you're saying that one day you put butter on bread and you got it this far, and then you remembered. <laughs> yeah, and you, and you just stayed like that, and everybody started laughing because. You know, I mean, I think many people have been in that situation at one time or another. And that's another thing that sometimes we've had to remind guests who are here. You know, not the one-day guests, but people who are staying for a while, remind them, you know, please sit down when you eat. Yeah. Or remind people, we had one person, (laughs) uh, you know, with his spoon in his cereal bowl, you know, making so much noise. (laughs) And completely oblivious, you know, not realizing it. Yeah. So this whole idea of mindful eating, you know, 
uh, and kind of introducing people to that idea and, you know, saying things gently to them and respectfully. And same with people coming in and putting their Dharma books on the floor or stepping over Dharma books or putting their teacup or their mala on top of the Dharma books. You know, sometimes we just have to very politely say, oh, maybe you don't know this, but this is how we do it. And, and usually if you're polite and, and you say it that way, like maybe you don't know it, then, then, you know, they, actually they're quite happy because most people who come, they, they don't want to do anything that disturbs other people. Yeah? And so they welcome it. You know, of course, then there's other people who wish this, this place were like a spa. But, <laughs> you know, what to do? Can't please everybody. I thought that was a great comment. <laughs> oh, that we have a puritanical yeah, view of sex. I just to come back to that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's so interesting because it's a monastery. <laughs> so I'm wondering, uh, you know, maybe it's partly out of the non unfamiliarity with a monastery. Yeah. I have a little bit grown up Catholic mm-hmm. that you know, we would have never said to the nuns or priests, yeah, but you're technical we were sex because they're monastic I mean they're you know Right. And yeah. so it's like, well when you say that to monastics, what are you thinking? I, I think yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, I think you bring up an important point here that people who were raised Catholic may have more sensitivity to this issue. Yeah, because they were, were exposed to priests and monks and nuns when they were little. Whereas people who grew up Protestant or people who didn't have any kind of particular religious upbringing, you know, there's no idea of of a place where people are celibate because your ministers and your rabbis and all these people have families. Yeah, they're not celibate. So many people, you know, it may not enter their enter their mind. Yeah, because of you know the background they come from. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think this is a good point. I mean, in fact, nobody from Asia would feel that what we're doing is puritanical because it's part of the culture that they grew up with. Whereas in America, you know, like I was saying, if it's a Protestant culture and you didn't grow up with it, then, yeah. In fact, some people from Asia come here and you know, they're really rather surprised that we have men and women sitting together, you know, and they and they say, oh, look, you should have women on one side of the room and men on the other side of the room, and they shouldn't sit at the same dining room table, and you should have two lines for food, one food line for women, one food line for men, you know. So some people are quite surprised. So we're we're stuck in the middle. We're trying to you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, do something that follows our own culture, and yet, uh, you know, hold the monastic precepts well. And so at the end of the day, nobody's going to be happy with what you do, so you just do what you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not, uh? I'm so puzzled when you say this, but I also recall many times, actually, in various locations, when we talk about the body, Mm-hmm. How angry some people are. Oh, yeah. So angry to actually think about having to look at the body as the built factory and that, you know, that view and what that means and how that affects our identity and how, how important people's kind of sexual expression is. Some people, it's like, who, you know, some part of who they are and so not feeling like I can carry that comfortably in. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I think this is a, another good point. You're saying you've noticed that on retreats that I've led at different places, when I've talked about the body and the nature of the body, you know, and that the, it produces pee and poo and everything like that, that some people get very upset and very angry. And that's really true. You know, I mean, it's, I'm just describing what what the body is. But as you say, the people's identity is very um, mixed in with the body, and their sexual expression is very important to them. And so when you start saying, you know, uh, talking about the body like Shanti Deva does, they get really, really upset. And, you know, oh, you're against sex, and, you know, you're puritanical, and you don't like couples, and, you know, da 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 da, because it's something that's very important to them in their lives. Mm. Yeah. That's another thing, too, that, that especially with the sexual revolution in America and the different sexual values, when people come now to a place where sex is not an important thing to us, you know, and we're really not <laughs> into it, then people say, oh, you want to go back to the 1950s? Yeah, this, you're, very, you're so puritanical, and, you know, you think sex is dirty, and the body's dirty, and sex is bad, and, you know, and you're, you're stifling your sexual, your sexuality, and so it must come from some inner neurosis that you have, and, oh, no, I've heard people say that, yeah. you know, you're suppressing your sexuality, and, you know, these kinds of things, yeah. So it very much could be because of the, again, the sexual revolution in America. Because what we're doing is not what the rest of the world is doing, is it? You know, only other monastics. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, most other people, and, and especially in this country where there is sex all over the place, the idea uh, that you're cultivating a mind that isn't interested in sex seems, you know, so crazy to some people. Yeah, yeah, something's wrong with those people that they're not interested in this. Yeah. yeah. I often think of the situation I was in, it was an odd situation, but it was in a kind of a very casual group where there was a Catholic man, and it was kind of a game, and it was a thing about revealing sexual orientation. Know, who likes what, da, 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 da. And the nun was so clear. Of, I mean, somebody actually turned to her point blank and said, what about you? And it was very quite rude. But, but her view was so clear that she said, I am not a sexual orientation. And it was just like so kind of pure in the way that she thought. She wasn't mm -hmm. going to fight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there was no way that she really had that kind of identification in her. Mm -hmm. I think of her a lot. Yeah. 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 So you you're saying that you were once in a group. It sounds like a very strange kind of group where people are making each other. You know. Yeah, strange party game. But anyway, some, there was a Catholic nun there, and people asked her about her sexual orientation, and she just looked and said, 
I don't have one. I'm not, I don't relate to the world in that way. Yeah. And I remember hearing uh, one Buddhist monk, you know, he's gay, and he says when people ask him what he is, he says, I'm nomosexual. <laughs> No more sexual. <laughs> no more sexual. <laughs> yeah. So it doesn't really matter if you're gay or, or you're straight, if you're, if you're celibate, you know. It's just, you, you drop all of that altogether. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're relating to things differently. And then, you know, people who don't have that interest, you know, don't understand what, what in the world you're doing. Yeah, it seems very strange to them. <laughs> okay. Mm. So in all these cases, it is better to remain silent. <laughs> <laughs> not to rise, and so on, which is perfectly logical. For in doing so, the benefits outweigh the damage. I can think of another situation where it's perfectly all right not to answer a question. When you're on the way to the bathroom and somebody stops you to ask you something. <laughs> I know that from experience around here. <laughs> So these exceptions relate first to the subject uh, being ill, a subject being the person who has the, va the precepts, being ill or asleep, then to the situation, teaching Dharma or discussing it, cheering up those who are distressed, and listening to Dharma teachings, and finally concerning answering uh, uh, various needs. After all, Lord Buddha's teaching is meant to help people. If our behavior provokes bad reactions in people, activates their latent kleshas, or disturbs others in any way, it is obviously better to abstain from it. This is the general rule when helping others. Okay, so if what we're going to do is going to disturb them or active, you know, get them really furious or whatever, then it's better to abstain. But we don't do this at the cost of our, of our monastic precepts. Yeah. Because, like, somebody could come here and get very upset. Yeah, but that doesn't mean we change how the monastery is run. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the example that you uh, that when some, many people just feel comfortable, mm -hmm. we can think about the Karmapa situation. Mm -hmm. you're giving a, you're giving a teaching or something, a, a Dharma and someone asks you, which one is the... Ah, uh-huh. <coughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good example. So when um, you're saying if uh, an example of when um, answering a question could potentially disturb a great number of people, is you're saying, like, if you're in... Uh, in a, uh, if you're giving a Dharma talk or something, and somebody asks you about a controversial issue, yeah, like what do you think about this, and you don't know who the people in the audience are, and, and so, you know, you don't want to be unskillful and say something that would just create a lot of animosity and misunderstanding, then certainly in that kind of situation, yeah, that's a very good example. It would be better not to answer the question. Yeah. Or just say, you know, we'll talk about that later, or, uh, you know, that's something different than what we're discussing now, or something like that. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So these two misdeeds are associated, the two, three, and four, um, uh, these two misdeeds are associated with afflictions when we refuse to rise and so forth or answer questions out of pride and animosity, which leads to ill will or anger, which agitates our mind. Okay? So we're proud and we don't want to stand up, 
or we're angry at somebody we don't want to stand up, or we're angry at them, we don't want to answer a question, or we're arrogant, you know, that's question stupid. Yeah, so that kind of thing. So that is um, a misdeed with affliction. The misdeeds are dissociated from afflictions when they are motivated by thought, sloth, laziness, or forgetfulness. Thus, if we do not answer because we are too lazy or slothful to do so, or because we have forgotten that we should not behave in this way, we commit a misdeed dissociated from, affli- uh, from afflictions. Laziness, of course, is an affliction, so the expression dissociated from afflictions is not to be taken literally. Okay, so, so laziness is an affliction, but when it's saying, um, you know, a misdeed with affliction, it's referring to, to a misdeed like arrogance or anger, something that's quite impotent like that, not just like sloth and laziness, even though they're, they stem from afflic- their afflictions too. Nevertheless, when more negative emotions like uh, arrogance, ill will, and anger do not come into play, we speak of misdeeds dissociated from afflictions, for they are less serious than those motivated by these disturbing factors. Okay? Both misdeeds are contrary to the precept of the ethic of helping living beings, which is to protect their minds by avoiding upsetting or troubling them. Okay? So here we have the, the thing of, okay, why do we show respect to seniors? Yeah. Well, here it's saying to avoid troubling their mind or to avoid troubling the minds of other people who see these people as worthy of respect. Yeah. And so if we're just disrespectful and nonchalant and everybody's equal, it can disturb, you know, a number of people's minds. And it can also make the person we're being disrespectful towards think, well, you know, what, what's going on here? You know, what kind of dharma is this person serious about the dharma or not? Yeah, or are they just kind of on some ego trip? Okay. And so same thing about answering questions. Because sometimes, I mean, if we're rude and we just walk away and, you know, somebody says, how are you? And we go, <laughs> you know, then people are offended and their feelings are hurt. So, yeah, to avoid doing that kind of thing. We, we protect them from hurt feelings that come from our inconsiderate behavior. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, when we were in Taiwan, it was such a... Uh, So you're saying when you were in Taiwan, the whole kind of ethic at the monastery was you don't disturb other people. Yeah, no matter whether they're seniors or, or not seniors, you you try and be aware of things that, that could disturb them, and then you avoid doing those things. Yeah. And then it creates such a nice environment. I mean, sometimes you really have to restrain yourself because it's like, I want to know this now, and the other person's in the middle of doing something, you know, and so, but you see, I'm exempt from that, and that's why I interrupt all of you when you're busy worth working, but, um, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but it is hard sometimes to know, oh, this isn't the right time to interrupt somebody, or this isn't the right time to make this a suggestion, or to give feedback, or to ask a question. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to read something here about monastics and lay people mm-hmm. um, that is in the ballpark. But it's, it's something that um, I, I get frustrated about or confused about. So as a lay person here, and I'm wanting other lay people to respect the monastics, mm-hmm. so I try to model, like if a monastic's coming, or if I'm going at one, Mm-hmm. 
Right. right. Mm-hmm. But I find, and I think it might be because our monastics are Westerners, they're not always comfortable. Mm-hmm. So they'll step back mm-hmm. and try and have the guests go first, or you know, and it gets confusing. Mm-hmm. I don't think the guests feel confused. Mm-hmm. And um. I just wonder about it. Yeah, it seems like a time to talk yeah. about the Okay, so so you're saying that it it, it becomes confusing because as a lay person you're trying to set a, a good example for other lay people who come here of how to respect the monastics. But sometimes the monastics don't want to be respected in that way. Yeah, or whatever it is. Yeah, it's like you know you're trying to to let them go first, and you're teaching new people who come here to let the monastics go first. And then the, the next thing after you teach them that, uh, you know, the, there comes along a monastic and somebody steps back and they say, no, no, you go in. Okay. <laughs> so, so it seems quite confusing. Yeah. So it's, um, it's a funny kind of situation because, uh, you know, at lay people, should show respect to the monastics. Again, not you're not respecting the individual per se. You're respecting the precepts and the robes. It has nothing to do with that individual. Okay, it's the precepts and the robes. You know, so you want to show respect to that. But then sometimes it gets to be too much. Like I know for me, sometimes you know, if if I'm just trying to come in and get medicine meal and then everybody at two at four tables stands up you know it it's too much yeah but th- but then there's other times where i walk in the door and i'm you know carrying dishes and nobody even looks yeah <laughs> let alone stand up yeah not so so it's somehow finding some kind of medium yeah um i think it it's always good, you know, that we have the intention to to show respect. But if somebody says to us, "No, you don't need to," then you know that's okay. Then then we don't. But in some situations, it could be that uh, you know a monastic. The way people are coming to the door is that the layperson is there. First, so the monastic may just say, okay, go ahead. But that doesn't mean every time you're coming to a door that you, you know, as a lay person, you go in first. It means, you know, if you're coming at a different time and somebody's slightly ahead of you, you step back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there, you know, you have to have some sensitivity to when somebody says no need to do that, whether it means in this particular situation or forever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you need some kind of sensitivity to that. Yeah? Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. I think that probably along the lines of making it clear that we are respecting the roles and the precepts. Mm -hmm. Because I know we did our last community meeting, Lorena and the Kenyans, I think it was Susan, they stated that they had felt really, really moved by the fact that they're dealing with people with monastics and their whole concept of monastics. They had us kind of up on a pedestal. Mm-hmm. And to see us get sick and struggle and have to work with our minds and deal with affliction, mm-hmm. they say that this really warms their hearts and has made them feel like we're human beings and that we have yeah. the same struggle. So, so on one mm-hmm. hand, I understand. And from that, I see that, that that's how the respect is how I want my the respect for what these precepts are for me that we earn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's this balance of if the people understand that that's what they're that's that's what they're inviting into the door is the precepts and the roles and that idea mm-hmm. and not somebody they put on a pedestal because right. they treat us as special person. Right. So when I heard that from them and I felt that this was a wonderful experience and us always remember that. Yeah. 
not model. Well, we do <laughs> have the same struggles that they do. But to know what we do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So you're saying it's important for lay people to remember that they're really respecting the robes and the precepts, you know, that come from the Buddha, and that you know there's no need to put monastics up on a pedestal as an individual because we have the same struggles that everybody else does. Yeah. And when people kind of expect you to be floating around up there somewhere, it can be quite uncomfortable. Because I know we first were here, and you were here living at the Abbey for the first few years. It was quite a reality check for our local Dharma friends to realize that the people that lived at the Abbey didn't. Yeah. I know that that was quite a shift for them when they... Yeah. Well, face it, nobody ever sees us the way we want them to see us, do they? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of what you're, the comment you're making, it reminds me of in the, um, the sangha receiving food prayer. Mm-hmm. And I'm always very moved to hear that line that although we are not perfect, we will be our best to be wor- Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And that's a, uh, something we need to remind ourselves of so that, you know, there's no conceit that, or a pri- feeling of privilege that develops, thinking that, oh, we're so great. You know, it's not we're so great. It's the robes and the precepts. It has nothing to do with us. Yeah. But we try and behave properly. Yeah, because <laughs> if we don't, then people get quite upset. Yeah, and for good reason, you know. They anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, most secondary misdeeds are at times associated with kleshas and at other times dissociated from them. The second misdeed, uh, maintaining thoughts of desire, is an exception. If you recall, it consists of giving desire, dissatisfaction, or attachment to goods or signs of respect, a free reign when they arise in us, and doing nothing to oppose them. By its very nature, this fault is always associated with clashes, okay, with afflictions. Okay, number five not accepting invitations. The fifth secondary misdeed is refusing invitations. By it, we deny a person the opportunity to practice generosity. Training in generosity well includes helping others to practice it. Okay, so generosity doesn't just mean (coughs) that we're being generous. It means also that we learn to receive others' generosity gracefully. And I've done many discussion groups on this with people. And it's very interesting uh, how many people say that it's easier for them to give than to receive. Because when they give, some people say, I feel like I'm in charge. But when I receive, I feel obligated to the other person. And that's uncomfortable. I feel like I owe them something. This is all just the junk going on in people's minds, you know. Uh, And then some people say, I feel embarrassed when other people give to me, or I feel unworthy and I I don't deserve it, so I want to refuse. Or I'm afraid it's going to be too much for the other person, or, you know, any number of reasons. And so we feel uncomfortable accepting other people's generosity. And what he's saying here is that, you know, since we're doing the precepts now that have to do with far-reaching generosity, generosity also involves being able to receive so that we give somebody else the opportunity to be generous. Yeah, Because if we're always going around, no, 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 you know, then people don't have the opportunity to give. Yeah. And sometimes people really want to give, and they, they feel badly if we refuse to accept 
they're offering. You know, they feel like, what, you know, am I deficient or is this not good? You know, what I'm offering is not good or, you know, what, what's the story? Why aren't you accepting what I'm offering? Yeah, so we have to be quite sensitive to this kind of thing. Um, you know, and so we'll go through this and we'll see the different exceptions when we can say no and, you know, and so on. But one thing that I've learned from it is, uh, well, I'll tell you the stories as we go along. <laughs> Let me read some more. Okay. The misdeed can occur in a variety of ways. Someone may, um, actually this is not accepting invitations, it's the next one of not accepting gold and so forth. So that's talking about accepting offerings, but the same applies to invitations, you know. Somebody invites us and then we say no, and like, oh dear, you know, the, what I'm offering you is not good enough or, you know, am I, I'm too low on the social scale or I don't, you know, what's wrong with me or, you know. Could be, people could be very upset by it. So the, mis, um, the misdeed can occur in a variety of ways. Someone may invite us for a meal, for example. When motivated by pride, animosity, or anger, we decline the invitation. We commit a misdeed associated with clashes, with afflictions. Okay. We, uh, so let's say we refuse the invitation in the hope that it will cause a problem for other people or hurt their feelings. Okay, so somebody might might do that. They might be mad at somebody, and you know somebody is trying to to um, you know hold out the what do you the peace flag, you know, and invites you somewhere, and you say no. Yeah, you know, with the intention that they feel hurt and offended, and know that you're upset with them. If you do not accept an invitation simply because. Um, you're lazy or slothful, you know, and don't want to go. Uh, the misdeed is dissociated from clashes, from afflictions, okay? So again, here's the thing. So what would be an example of refusing inv an invitation out of pride? Yeah. Yeah, you know, you don't... Uh, you know, the person isn't good enough, you know, they, they're, they're not, I only go to homes of rich people, yeah, or I only want to go out in public with people who drive nice cars, or people, you know, who take me to nice restaurants. I don't want to go to people who just take me down the street to, you know, to the coffee shop. Yeah, so some kind of arrogance, uh, you know of their inferior, or I'm just so in superior, okay? Or with anger, you know, what are you bugging me for? Just, you know, leave me alone, or I don't want to, I don't have anything to do with you. Yeah, so being angry and dismissing them, uh, you know, not accepting the invitation like that. Okay, so, so those kind of situations. This is not saying you have to accept every invitation. Because sometimes if you do, then all, you would have no time to do your Dharma practice. Yeah. So I know for myself, like um, when I was first, you know, when I was, did my first tour around the U.S. Teaching, teaching the Dharma, I had very much in mind, you know, I want to be easy to take care of and, you know, I want to please people and, and so on. And so whenever people asked me out for, you know, because I was going all around and if they wanted to go out for dinner before uh, uh, a class or they wanted to have, a, you know, people over before class, I would do it. And then I realized, boy, the quality of my teaching was not so good after that. And so then I, I realized I have to say to people, before I give a Dharma teaching, you know, please don't plan a social event because the quality of the teaching you're going to receive is will suffer. And the reason I'm coming here is to share the Dharma with you, not to go out and have a good social time. Yeah. So I began, you know, saying that to people and they were fine with it. They, you know, they accepted it. Yeah. So sometimes you have to set those limits or sometimes people invite you uh, to to their home and 
you know, you know you're going to get back really late, but you have your evening commitments to do. So in that kind of situation, then it's okay to, you know, excuse yourself. I have my commitments to do. Yeah. Or somebody invites you to some kind of social event where um, it's really not appropriate for monastics to go. You know, let's say it's a, an event where people are drinking, you know, or, or somebody takes out a joint. I mean, I've been at, at those kinds of things where somebody has asked me over to dinner. You know, a Buddhist has asked me to dinner, you know, some other Buddhist, and then they, they start drinking. And it's like, I feel so uncomfortable, and I would not have accepted the invitation if I had known that they would do this. And I've even been at one place where people started smoking dope, and, <laughs> you know, and I just, really, and I just excused myself. Oh, and then I was at another place. I, I, oh, th- this, this one is a real good one. I was in um, one Eastern European country. And the people there didn't know much about monastics or dharma. I think maybe a couple of t- teachers had been there before or whatever. Uh, and, but, you know, I was scheduled to go through there. And so I was staying at the flat of one man and his girlfriend. And, you know, we went and I gave the dharma teaching and everything. And then we all came back to his flat. And he invited, you know, all these other people to come back to the flat. And then what it turned into was this big makeout party. And all these couples are sitting in this room making out. And yeah, and I just went in the bedroom. It's like no idea how to behave around a monastic. It was really embarrassing. It's like, you know, I don't want to be here. But I was staying at their house, you know, so I just went in the bedroom and closed the door. Then another time, this I've had some exciting adventures <laughs> when I've traveled. Then in another time, this was I was in another country. Again, it was uh, one that used to be part of the Soviet Union, you know, but split off afterwards. And again, the people <coughs> didn't know much about monastics or whatever. And I didn't know until... We, I got to the flat where I was staying, that it was the flat of a single man, you know. And I went in the bathroom, and there's this poster of a naked woman. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, where am I? <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> and then he, he offered to take my coat, and, you know, kind of reached out to help me take it off, and I'm going, no, no, I, I can take it off. <laughs> so that's why <laughs> we've learned not to assume anything when you go traveling and to tell people, you know, please, you know, in the house of, you know, either where there's only women or if there's a couple, you know, with a, with a woman and in a separate bedroom and, you know, and not, not in the master bedroom where the couple does their stuff and, you know. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's just amazing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Be <charitable> you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> Okay. Um, where was I? <laughs> okay. So there are several exceptions. <laughs> the first group relates to the basis or subject. That is, the person invited us who holds the bodhisattva uh, precepts. Exceptions are made when we're too ill to go, when we've already accepted another invitation. Okay. An additional legitimate reason for declining is that the place to which we're invited is very far away or the road to it is very dangerous. Yeah? And then, like I say, too, if you have your commitments to do or if as a nun it's a single man inviting you to, to, you know, go out for a meal 
Oh, should I tell you this story? <laughs> this is a good one. So, um, I was uh, I was in Hong Kong. You know, I was at the the Dharma. I was staying at my friend's house. They didn't really have a Dharma center at that time, uh, so the teachings were at different people's flats. Yeah, so I, I had newly arrived, and this man called, you know, and said, oh, are you the new teacher at the Dharma Center? And I said, yes, and he said, oh, I would like to invite you out to lunch, and I thought, fine, you know, and, um, you know, I, this, yeah, this is what happens when you don't learn things early on. So I, I just said, fine, you know, even though he was a stranger. So he picked me up, and then we went to some, some club or something like this, you know. It was, so it was fine, and we're sitting there having uh, our meal. And then he says, do you practice Tantra? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I, I do some Tantra practice and, you know, some mantras and he, like that. And he said, yeah, but do you practice Tantra? You know, do you, do you have tantric sex? And, and uh, you know, I'm really interested in this practice of tantric sex. And can you help me learn it? And it like, um, you know, and there I am. It was lunch. It was broad daylight. But, you know, I'm with this guy. You know, and I'm wondering, how am I going to get back to the flat okay? Yeah. So, yeah, so this is the reason why nuns don't <laughs> go places alone. <laughs> I mean, I was so shocked. <laughs> I, I just said, no, I don't do that. I know nothing about that kind of practice. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> And I want to go home. And I, no, thank you. I don't want any dessert. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, not like that, but. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was. Yeah, because I mean, you don't know who you could get stuck with. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so there are times when you don't accept invitations. <laughs> you know, and so my, my new rule of thumb, and we've had to work this out sometimes when she's arranging, you know, my travel, because even sometimes it doesn't enter your mind. When I was going to, um, to Pennsylvania, you know, for, for His Holiness's teachings, then I was landing at like 10 o'clock at night, and the people were arranging for a man who I don't even know to pick me up. And she had arranged this. And then when I heard it, I said, no. No, that's not appropriate for a man I don't know to pick me up at the airport, especially at night. Yeah. So. OK. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> enough stories. <laughs> enough stories. After retreat, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, the second criterion for exceptions concerns the person who has extended the invitation. If we know that the host is inviting, who is inviting us has evil intentions, <laughs> or, for example, hopes to use the opportunity to criticize us or embarrass us or ridicule us or, you know, put us in some kind of uncomfortable position or start a con we know the person wants to start a conversation that, that we're going to be very uncomfortable with or something like that then it's better for the host that we don't accept. Yeah. Oh, I'm remembering another situation. Uh, <laughs> okay. 
Um, let's see, could we? Okay. So the third criterion is purpose or necessity. There are a number of situations where it is wiser not to accept the invitation, each for a good reason. So one, in the long run, it is more helpful to the people who have invited us to decline the invitation than to accept it, even if it saddens them at first, because the refusal makes them reflect. They will speculate why we have refused and perhaps conclude that they might have done something wrong. This will lead them to search until they find their error and hopefully convince them to be more careful in how they behave in the future. Okay, so if it's for a, a good reason, somebody was really acting inappropriately and you need to get them to reflect on their actions. Yeah. Two. Um, accepting interferes with our regular Dharma practice. If we have many daily commitments, for example, that requires time to fulfill. Okay? Three, accepting the invitation would prevent us from attending a certain Dharma teaching that we have never heard before or one that uh, we have not yet fully mastered. So, you know, there's a Dharma teaching going on at the same time and somebody invites you somewhere, then it's perfectly legit. And you should actually uh, decline. Or it would keep us from participating in an important discussion, debate, or study group with Dharma friends that would allow us to learn new material. Okay. The next one, accepting the invitation conflicts with monastic rules, either for us if we are, are ordained or for the host if he or she is. Okay. So, you know, if you're keeping um, the, the precept not to eat in the evening strictly and somebody invites you out in the evening, it's fine to say, sorry, I don't eat. Yeah, I don't eat in the evening. And just explain it to them and that's fine. You know, similarly about, you know, monastics going to weddings or social gatherings with our old friends, it's really not appropriate. Yeah, or going to parties where we know that they're going to be serving alcohol or, or whatever. So it's perfectly fine to decline in those kind of situations. Mm -hmm. So it's a story about a, a, a nun who was new, who was asked by another nun to go out to dinner with some Rinpoche's. And she accepted the invitation because she wanted to go. But what it did, it was the first time that she started eating in the evening. And so after that, she, she, didn't, she kept on doing it. Yeah. Okay, um, accepting the invitation would upset a large number of people, generate strong negative reactions in them, or make them very uncomfortable. Okay, so, yeah, in those kind of situations, then it's perfectly all right to, to decline. If, if uh, in any of these situations, declining an invitation is not a secondary misdeed. Okay. So if going somewhere is really going to, you know, set a lot of number, pe number of people off and their afflictions are going to really flare up and, and so on, then you can politely decline the invitation. Yeah. Sometimes working with our family is quite difficult. In these, you know, some families are very understanding of us being monastics uh, and then other families aren't. So you have to really work work according to your family in terms of what what they'll accept. 